Welcome everyone. Today we're going to begin our journey into the human anatomy. This is a foundational subject for everyone interested in allied health, medicine, or biology. Whether you're here for because it's a requirement or because you're passionate about the body, the content in this course will prove useful in more ways than you might imagine. These are our goals for this chapter. We'll be defining what anatomy is, and we're also going to distinguish it from physiology. We're going to explore how the body is organized from the smallest to the most complex levels and learn the most basic language used to describe the structures and locations in the human body. Anatomy is all about the structure. That's what we're looking at when we talk about anatomy. Think of it as the what and where of the body. We're talking about bones, organs, or tissues. That's the anatomy part of it. It includes studying both what we can see and what requires a microscope to observe. Physiology, on the other hand, is about the function, how and why the body works the way it does. When you ask, how does the heart pump blood? What happens when you digest food? That is physiology. You'll see quickly that we can't study one without the other. Structure informs function and understanding one deepens our understanding of the other. Understanding how anatomy was studied historically gives us the appreciation of how far it has come. Originally, our knowledge came from the external injuries, particularly, especially from the battlefield. When we were looking at battlefield wounds, which limited what we could know about the internal organs and systems. We could only see what was out on the exterior, not what was on the inside. As societies evolved, more, uh, more cultures began to permit cadaver dissections, which significantly advanced our anatomical knowledge. Dissection became essential for medical education, and today it remains a key practice in med schools and anatomy labs. The 20th century brought a lot of technology and the technological revolution. X-rays were, were the first major breakthrough, followed by more advances in imaging like CT scans, MRI, ultrasound, and even PET scans. These tools give clinicians the power to see inside the body without surgery, allowing us to detect conditions like tumors, fractures, or internal bleeding safely and accurately. These advances make anatomy not only more precise, but also more dynamic. We can now study living, moving, functioning human bodies in ways early anatomists could only imagine. Anatomy includes everything from what we can see on the, for, with our eyes to what requires more powerful microscopes. Gross anatomy looks at the large structures while microscopic anatomy zooms into the cells and tissues, giving us the insight into their roles and their relationships. There's two general ways we study anatomy. We study the regional anatomy and also the systemic anatomy. In regional anatomy, we examine everything in a specific area of the body, the muscles, bones, nerves, vessels, and other organs, all together as they relate to one another. For example, if we're studying the neck region, we'll look at the trachea, cervical vertebrae of muscles like the sternocleidomastoid, blood supply, and nerves all in one unit. This is, uh, this is the approach used in dissections and surgery, where knowing how everything fits together in a particular space is crucial. In contrast, systemic anatomy is more common in classroom settings like ours. It breaks the body into systems, so insight of knowing so instead of looking at all the parts in the thorax, for example, we might study the entire circulatory system, starting with the heart and then moving into the arteries, veins, capillaries across the whole body. Both approaches are useful. Regional anatomy gives you a situational awareness, great for clinicians. Systemic anatomy helps you build the, fun uh, the functional understanding of how each system works as a whole. And by the end of this course, you'll be able to connect the dots between the two. One of the most powerful principles in biology is the idea that form follows its function. In other words, the way something is built directly relates to how it, uh, to what it can do. This is true at every level of organization in the human body, from the entire organs down to the individual molecules. Take the eyelid, for example. 
For instance, its thin, flat muscle and highly respect, uh, responsive nerves allows it to blink quickly and uh, automatically. These rapid reflexes is essential for clearing debris and protecting the delicate surface of the eye. If the eyelid were more thick or slow moving, it, would be, it wouldn't be able to serve that role. Another example is a neuron. It's a long, slender axon. It's perfectly designed to carry messages across long distances, like from your spinal cord to your toes. These structures specifically, especially the length and insulation, support its high-speed signaling function. This idea that uh, even applies to molecular level. The 3D shape of a protein, for example, determines whether it can bind to a receptor or catalyze a chemical reaction. A slight change in form, like a mutation, can completely change or destroy its function. So whether we're studying anatomy or physiology, always ask yourself, how does the structure of this part allow it to do its job? That mindset will serve you throughout this course and the future work you do in healthcare or even biology. So why do we start with anatomy before jumping into physiology? The answer is simple. You have to know what something is and where it is before you can understand what it does or how it works. Think about the heart. If you don't know the layout of the atria, ventricles, and valves, then trying to uh, understand how blood moves through the heart or how the heart murmur forms will be really confusing. This course and this textbook begin with the anatomy so that we can build a solid structure and map out the body. Later than when you learn about the process like digestion, respiration, or nerve signaling, you'll be ready to know the stomach is and how the lungs are shaped and how the nerves connect to the muscles. This approach mirrors real-time world uh, path of health professionals. Doctors, physical therapists, nurses, and all others begin their training with anatomy labs and dissections. Whether you're headed into healthcare or not, learning the structure first will help you make sense of everything that comes after so take your time with this part of the course ask questions look at the models trace pathways the stronger your foundation to anatomy is the more natural physiology will follow before we dive into the individual systems it's important to understand how the body is organized from the smallest part particles to the complete person this is known as the levels of structural organization, and it gives you the framework for understanding anatomy in layers. We start with the chemical level, the foundation of all matter. Atoms like hydrogen, oxygen, or calcium combine to form molecules such as protein, sugars, and DNA. These are the raw ingredients for life. Next, at the cellular level, molecules form organelles and cells, the smallest independently functioning units of life. Each cell has a specialized part and role. A muscle cell, for example, is built to contract, uh, to contract while the nerve cell is built to send the signals. When the similar cells work together, we reach tissue level. Think of muscle tissue made up of many muscle cells or connective tissue, which support and bind other tissues together. Multiple tissues working together form an organ. Like a bladder, it contains muscle tissue to contract, epithelial tissue to line and protect it, and connective tissue to support it. Several organs that cooperate to form a broader function make up an organ system, like the urinary system, which includes kidneys, ureters, bladder, and the urethra. And finally, we arrive at the organism, uh, organism level. This complete human body in which all the systems work in harmony. This is the level where everything comes together to maintain homeostasis and allow for life to continue. Understanding these levels helps you uh, helps you see how structure binds upon structure and how problems at even the smallest level can affect the entire body. Anatomical terminology isn't meant to confuse. It's here to help us be precise. A term like above the wrist could mean several things, but anterior to the carpal region is exact. These terms are built from ancient Greek and Latin. So their meanings don't change and they help avoid miscommunication in clinical and academic settings. These are used globally in healthcare to reduce a lot of error and they are built from roots, prefixes, and suffixes. Like example, when we, talk, when we say the word hyper, we're usually talking about something that is high or above. Tension means pressure, like putting that together, 
Hypertension means high blood pressure. Just like a map uses north as a reference, we use anatomical position as our constant reference point. No matter how someone is lying or moving, all terms assume that we are standing upright, facing forward with palms forward. This prevents confusion and keeps, us, uh, keeps our descriptions consistent. So when we talk about anatomical position, it's always our feet down on the ground, toes moving forward, thumbs away from the midline, point, our palms pointing out, and our eyes forward. Always assume that we are talking about an anatomical position. When we say the word supine, that means we are lying face up, and then prone, we are lying face down. These terms let us describe where structures are relative to one another. For example, the heart is medial to the lungs and your wrist is distal to your elbow. Learning these pairs will help you read and write about anatomy accurately and confidently. So when we're talking about the terms like anterior and posterior, anterior is always in the front, posterior is always in the back. Superior is in reference to above, something above something else. Inferior, something below something else. Medial, we're always talking about the midline, the, the midline being the middle of the body. When we're talking about something that is lateral, we're talking about away from that midline. If something is medial, we're going towards it. If it's something is lateral, we're going away from it. The same with proximal versus distal. Proximal means closer to, and then distal means farther away from the trunk. We're usually talking about limbs at this point. When we're using Proximal and distal, we're talking limbs. We're not talking the core of the body, we're talking about the limbs. Superficial means near the surface, and then deep means away from the surface, far from the surface. Then we talk about planes. We have different body planes, including sagittal, frontal, and transverse. Think of these planes as imaginary glass sheets slicing through the body. Imaging looks like MRI, and CT scans rely on these planes to capture views of organs. Knowing the plane tells you how to interpret the image, whether you're seeing a vertical slice or a horizontal cross section. When we're referencing something that is sagittal, we're basically dividing the body into left and right halves. When we're talking mid-sagittal, it is equal halves, right down the midline. Parasagittal means we're dividing into left and right sides, but it is unequal. The frontal or coronal plane divides the body into front and back, and then the transverse plane divides the top and the bottom of the body. So basically right down the middle. The body is organized into different cavities that house major organs. These cavities help protect organs and allow them space to move. For example, your lungs expand into the thoracic cavity and your intestines shift around the abdominal pelvic cavity during digestion. The dorsal cavity has two main parts, the cranial cavity, which includes the brain, and then the spinal cavity, which includes the spinal cord. The ventral cavity includes two major regions, the thoracic cavity, which is the lungs and the heart, and it also is subdivided into different regions, the pleural region, the pericardial region, and the mediastinum. The abdominal pelvic cavity is divided into the digestive and reproductive organs. Serous membranes act like protective bubbles that wrap uh, for organs. They have a very slippery fluid between the layers to reduce friction so your lungs can inflate, your heart can beat, and your intestines can move smoothly without irritating the surrounding tissues. So in a double membrane, a double layered membrane, we have the parietal, which is, lines the cavity wall, and then the visceral, which covers the organ itself. That fluid is called serous fluid and that helps reduce the friction. The major serous membranes in our body are our pleural membrane, which surrounds the lungs, the pericardial membrane, which surrounds the heart, and the peritone uh, peritoneum, which surrounds the abdominal organs. When diagnosing abdominal pain or locating a mass, we use quadrants or regions to describe what it is. Quadrants are faster used in emergencies, regions are more specific used in anatomy and physiology. For example, the appendix is in the right lower quadrant or right iliac region. When we talk about quadrants, we have four main quadrants. We use the right upper quadrant, RUQ, the left upper quadrant, LUQ, 
right lower quadrants, and left lower quadrants, which are centered at the umbilicus. Then when we talk about the different regions, we have nine different regions. These are used for more anatomical precision. We have the right and left, we have the three main regions, the hypochondriac, which is up top, the lumbar region, which is in the middle, and then the iliac region, which is lower. And in the center, we have the epigastric, the umbilical, and hypogastric regions. For much of history, people feared the dead or faced legal barriers for, to dissect. Without anesthesia or antibiotics, surgery was risky and not very informative. Most anatomical knowledge came from imagination or war runes. This changed during the Renaissance with da Vinci and Vesalus. Essentially, dissection became a formal part of medical training. This took place around the 14th century. Between the 14th and 19th centuries, dissections became legal in medical education and became more pronounced and done almost at every single medical school around the world. In 1895, Wilhelm Rotgen made a stunning discovery. Invisible rays that could pass through the skin and muscle, but not through the bone. He called them X-rays. And then transformed medical, uh, this transformed medicine almost overnight. They still used today to diagnose fractures and dental issues, though we now understand the risk of radiation. So x rays mainly show bones and bone structures. This was widely adopted in the 1900, and he actually won the Nobel Prize in 1901. Overexposure to x rays can actually damage your cells. The first x-ray that Wilhelm actually completed was on his wife's hand. Although modern techniques like CT and MRI are more sophisticated, x-rays remain essential in daily practices. They're fast and expensive and effective, especially for bone imaging. Today, we limit the exposure with shielding and precise calibration. CT scans revolutionized imaging by combining multiple x-rays into one detailed image. Think of it like slicing a loaf of bread. You see internal layers clearly. CT is excellent for internal bleeding, tumors, or stroke evaluation, but does not come with, uh, but does come with higher radiation exposure. It produces either a 2D or 3D image using computers. It's great for soft tissues, brain, chest, or your abdomen region. It's started to be more widely used in the 1970s. MRIs don't use x-rays, it uses magnetic fields. This makes it safe for repeated use and great for imaging soft tissues like brain or joints. However, patients must stay till, uh, must stay till in an oozy narrow space, which can be challenging for some. It produces a detailed image of soft tissue and organs and is high resolution, ideal for brain tumors and spinal cord. The downside it is it's very expensive, loud, and you are in an enclosed space for a long period of time. PET scans let us use, uh, see function, not just structure. By injecting a small radioactive tracer, we can see which part of the brain are active or where a tumor is metabolizing glucose. This is especially useful for cancer care and neurology. Ultrasound is one of the most safest and most common imaging tools. It, use, it is used widely in prenatal care, but also in cardiology and in abdominal, abdominal diagnostics. It's portable, non-invasive, and radiation-free, making it ideal in many clinical settings. The downside, the image quality depends heavily on the operator's skill. It cannot penetrate bones or air-filled spaces, and there's no major radiation use, which is why we use it mainly in pregnancy, looking at the heart or blood flow or looking for certain organs.